today. If you are new to the Harris Center, which some of you might be, I want to just take a moment and tell you a little bit about it. The Harris Center is in southwestern New Hampshire in a little town called Hancock. Um, and the work we do is a lot of land protection. We are about to have 25,000 acres of land protected, but much more than a land trust, the Harris Center has always been about helping people find connections to the natural world. We kind of like to think about ways of making people fall in love with the place that they're in. And tonight, if you're here for otters, you might already be in love with the place that you're in, especially if they have otters. Um, so it's really my absolute pleasure to introduce a person that I've heard a lot about, but never had the chance to meet, Mike Bottini. And I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about him. Um, he's currently working as a wildlife biologist with the Sea Tuck Environmental Association on Long Island in New York, where he's studying river otters, spotted turtles, Eastern coyotes and he monitors bald eagle nest and he's planning to launch a Long Island mammal survey this coming year. His past research subjects have included elk in Banff National Park while a graduate student at the University of British Columbia and piping plovers, common in least turns while working for the New York um, State Parks. He also teaches reading wildlife track and sign and other field oriented workshops. And he's the author of two nature guides, South Fork Trails and East End Paddling Guide and a river otter sign and survey manual, um, which is how I got onto it because me put it on my desk and I couldn't put it down. So I was like, I gotta get in touch with this guy. He's the founder of the annual Long Island Natural History Conference. Mike, it is really our pleasure to welcome you this evening to tell us everything that you've learned about otters. So yay. Okay, so um, thank you for inviting me to, to do this. I, I love talking about my research projects and I guess, um, it's kind of cool to be circling back to uh, a place that's near and dear to me, the Harris Center. Um, I, was, I, I was an outward bound instructor for some years. And a, as I uh, was working with those programs in various places, I realized that I was most interested in teaching natural history and field ecology things as opposed to uh, other things I enjoyed like teaching sailing and winter camping and, and uh, canoe tripping. <clears throat> and I took a year off um, to, to, uh, to do this program at Antioch University where I met two great instructors, Mead Cadeau and Tom Wessels. And, um, and Mead actually introduced me to, to, uh, to John Coolish. Um, and uh, that was a very fortuitous thing for me. I, we became very close friends. And, um, and I learned a lot, um, a lot with John and we did a lot of cool things, including teaching a course at St. Lawrence University, winter ecology very much modeled after Mead's terrific courses, uh, field courses, mammalogy, and um, I, th I think it might've been a nature in winter kind of a program too. But um, anyway, um, with that, uh, so I, I, I have to say that that experience that year really set me off um, on, a, on a new traje trajectory. And, um, and here I am today. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Mead. And um, okay, so uh, here we go. So a little bit about the natural history of the of the the river otter. Um, unfortunately, we, we're one of the things we're dealing with here on Long Island is road kills. That's that's the real significant mortality of this species here. There's a there's still no trapping season, and I hope there never will be a trapping season on Long Island. I think the, the roadkill mortality is going to create a situation um, in the long run where they really, you really can't justify a, uh, a sustainable harvest of this species here because of the fragmented nature of the, the landscape. Um, but these are some stats on the, on the size and pretty much the same as what's found in the literature. But a couple things about the, um, the adaptations and design. This is a really cool animal for those of you that are teaching uh, field ecology to, to kids. Um, you, can, you can just look at this and go over some of the unique adaptations for, um, 
living in an aquatic environment and compare it to other things like the beaver, the muskrat, uh, and the seal, and, and look at some of the trade-offs because the, the river otter really bridges um, the terrestrial and the aquatic environments. It gets most of its food in the aquatic environment, um, but spends 75% of its time on land. And one thing you'll notice right off the bat here is the, which is common amongst uh, semi-aquatic mammals and aquatic mammals, it, the, the nose, eyes, and the ears are all in a line near the top of the head um, so that they can limit their exposure as they're swimming to, through the water, uh, but you know, take advantage of those senses, um, see what's going on, on outside of the water environment. Um, it's got these long, stiff vibrissa, and those are very sensitive to um, movement, to water movement. So we know that they, are, they have an ability to track moving aquatic organisms uh, in, in the water uh, at night when it's dark or uh, in the winter under the ice that's covered with snow. So really dark environment. They don't really rely on their eyes that much uh, under those circumstances. They, they can also smell things um, underwater. What they'll do is they exhale a bubble on the surface of the organism and then, and then inhale that. And uh, we've actually videotaped that, not myself, but a colleague. Um, however, their vision is, is, they're nearsighted and that's an adaptation for seeing better underwater. Uh, but they, they can tell movement from a long distance, but they, they can't really discern stationary objects. And this may play a role in the fact that although they're an excellent swimmer, they can, their swimming speeds are, they can average seven miles an hour. So for example, they can cross the widest point of Long Island Sound from Connecticut to Long Island, which is 20 miles easily. But um, their longest recording open recorded open water crossing is uh, now is about uh, seven miles. And the, we, we think that they're not able to discern land masses uh, that far away or any further than that. Uh, their streamlined shape, um, long kind of cylinder shape is of course for the aquatic environment and um, a very unusual muscular tail which is flattened on the bottom. Uh, very large uh, web tined feet and I'll talk a, bit, a little bit about that later but the other trade-off they have is the, the lack of fat re, uh, 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 blubber that you would find in, um, in, a, in a seal um, and a little bit longer hair than a seal, but very, very short, very dense fur, um, unlike uh, the beaver and muskrat. And I have some, a statistic here that's kind of amazing. Um, let's see. Yeah, they're, um, short, dense fur. So the, the adult, your dogs, average about 9,000 hairs per square centimeter. This is gonna vary with way you count the hairs on the body, but that's, a, that's an average number, 9,000. And for otters, a square centimeter, again, variable, but the average is 60,000 um, hairs per square centimeter. It's a huge difference. And as a, if you look closely at an otter pelt, it's actually hard to part the, the hairs and the dense underfur and actually see skin. Um, so one of, the, one of the things that created a problem for the river otter during the fur trade era, unregulated trapping situation, uh, the 1600s, 1700s, and 1800s, was this was the gold standard for the uh, fur trappers. This was a very, very valuable pelt, very durable. Um, and that led to the demise of otters throughout their range in North America. And um, let's see, oh, the other thing I was very curious about, they have this underslung jaw, like a shark. Um, and, and apparently that's a design to give more um, 
the ability for more mus muscles to, to work that jaw and get more power in their bite. Um, I don't think it has, from what I've read, it has nothing to do with swimming per se. Um, oh yeah, and I wanted to also mention uh, uh, my, one of my theories of the vibrissa is that it may, um, because there's so many nerve endings in there that go to a certain particular spot in the brain, I have a feeling that the, the river otter and the seal uh, may be able to sense an electrical pulse. All living atoms give off an electrical pulse. And sharks have this, um, these little pores on their skin that they can, they can swim across the sand on the bottom of the ocean and detect prey that are buried in the sand. There's a fancy name for that, um, uh, which I forget, something of Lorenzo maybe. <laughs> it's kind of an Italian name. And um, uh, so I, I think there could be some research to look into this because there are records of blind seals surviving in the wild. And again, think about how they're, they're deep divers. They, they, can't, they can't really rely on light necessarily to find prey in, in deep water. And the river otter in the wintertime when its energy budget is, is something it has to really um, balance very carefully. Uh, they're going under the ice uh, at night, the days are short, and they can't really, you know, their sight is gonna be very limited in terms of finding prey. And some of my colleagues who study snapping turtles in Canada were telling me that uh, I'm, they're not happy about the fact that I'm an otter fan, but they, they, the otters dug out the snapping turtles from their hibernating sites in the bottom of these freshwater ponds. And of course they flip over a big snapping turtle and there's a lot of meat available. That has very small plastron uh, underneath, the, um, underneath its body. And um, yeah, so how do they find that? So this is a case where they're up in Canada. Uh, the, 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 the snapping turtles are not moving around, so they can't rely on uh, water movement um, to track down the prey and they're still able to find it. It could be smelling them out, but it's also possible that um, the vibrissa can detect that living organism down in the sediment. So, some new things to figure out. And here's a shot of that tail. The tail is about one third the total body length. And these are the hind feet. Um, quite uh, much larger than the front feet and, and very pronouncedly webbed. And when it tucks the two hind feet alongside that flattened tail, creates this nice large surface area and when they're swimming at their top speed, they're doing a dolphin motion. Um, so they're undulating their whole body. Their front feet are just tucked in to the chest and um, out of the way. They, they use the front feet for steering, but that's how they achieve that seven mile per hour speed. And I should note that when I swam in college and we took off from the starting block or we did our flip turns, the theory was get to the surface as quick as you can and start uh, swimming with your arms. Uh, this is for the freestyle. And nowadays, what do are, what are the real um, good swimmers do? If you watch the Olympic events. They go off the starting block and when they do their flip turn, they spend as much time as possible underwater doing this same dolphin motion uh, that the otter mimics. And um, yeah, it's the fastest way to move through the water. Uh, it's the least amount of resistance. Okay. Okay, a little bit about the habitat. So they, they use freshwater rivers. This is the Nisiquag River on Long Island. They, they'll use um, both fresh and saltwater ponds as well. And um, this is at Meshomek on Shelter Island. And they, um, they, in coastal areas, they'll, they'll definitely use, take advantage of that riparian area, the salt marsh and the shallow estuary. And here they'll go after uh, blue crab, lady crab, and, um, 
and and all, all the fish that are found in there. So this is it's a real treasure um, in terms of their their habits. So it, what's what was really fascinating for me in 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 tracking these around the landscape was realizing how small and 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 shallow uh, habitats that they'll take advantage of. So they'll they'll leave a nice tidal creek and cross over into a button bush swamp that maybe has six, eight inches of water in it and might be an eighth of an acre in size and they'll go hunting frogs. Um, they may also be getting crayfish in those areas and I'll talk about a little bit about that later. Um, so this some of the prey species they take advantage of. And, and one of the very common species we have in our coastal areas in those estuaries are two, two species of um, killifish. This is the striped killifish and we also have the mummy chog. And they're only about three to four inches in length, um, but they're fat, they have a lot of meat and the otters really go for them. They're, they're very easy for the otter to catch. And that's, that's the, uh, one of the number one things about otters, just go with what's available, plentiful and easy to catch. And um, another thing they really love is American eel, uh, which spend a lot of their time in the estuary and freshwater areas on Long Island. And this, in this case, they'll it's awkward for them to eat the eel in the water. So when they get a big carp or an eel, they generally will go ashore and, and uh, down it. And uh, blue, blue crab is another animal that they really like. For some reason, they, um, otters fed a strictly fish diet do not do very well in captivity. And, um, and, and I'm not sure what the connection is with these crustaceans. I haven't found any evidence of them eating our most ubiquitous uh, shellfish, the rib mussel, um, or, or the blue mussel for that matter. And they also, I think I have a slide of this. Yeah, uh, okay, well, this is, the, uh, this is the crayfish remains. So I came upon this one day, this was hours old and I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, um, is this, are these seeds, these white hard objects? Am I looking at an, uh, a raccoon latrine, which the all the outer latrines are very near raccoon latrines on Long Island. So I collected this and took it home and I rinsed the, the material out and, and put it through a, um, a sieve and uh, it, was, it was definitely crayfish remains. So um, I did a little, you know, book research and realized these are gastroliths. So unlike blue crabs, when they molt, they have enough calcium in the marine environment to regrow that shell quite quickly. But in the freshwater environment, the, um, the freshwater crayfish have to, um, it's better for them to, to pull the calcium in from the old shell and uh, before they molt and store it in these gastrolis, these stones that are in their stomach and then re reuse that calcium to grow, regrow their new shell faster. So really cool. And that's one of the things I love about doing field research. You always come upon things that um, are related somewhat to what you're doing, but um, kind of a cool thing to learn about. Okay, I mentioned um, river otters like crabs. I've never found remnants of fiddler crab in this scat. And a guy, a friend from Maryland sent me this picture. It's a river otter going through this uh, shallow mosquito ditch. It might even be walking uh, along it so shallow. And there are thousands of fiddler crabs on either side of it, which it totally ignored. I don't think there's enough meat to shell ratio to make it worth trying to get any sustenance out of it. And the, the last photograph he sent me in the sequence was the otter diving and coming up with a blue crab, which it happily munched away. 
Another thing about it, um, river otters that I was fascinated to learn is that the males travel together in groups of uh, as over a dozen at times. Now on Long Island, because they've the population here is still colonizing new areas and it's a fairly low population level. Um, th this is the most I've ever found in a group is uh, four. And they'll do cooperative hunting. So they'll like herd the fish to shore into shallow water where they can, they catch them. And, um, whoops, sorry. And, um, and another thing you should know about river otters, they're very, they're very sociable animals. When I'm trying to document them expanding their distribution on Long Island, I'm finding that they, the, the young, the juveniles that are dispersing, they'll find a nice area, but if there's no other otters in the neighborhood, they tend to move on and until they, until they find some uh, neighbors. Okay. And um, let's see. Oh yeah, let me just go back to that. There was one other thing I wanted to mention there. Um, so the, the otters are not territorial. They have home ranges that they, they, they don't really defend. They have overlapping home ranges. Makes it a little bit tricky to get a handle on how many otters you have in a particular watershed. The females have a core area within their home range where the natal den is, and they don't really like any males um, coming through that area. So that's it's sort of a, a territory that they defend, but really by marking. River otters are one of the species of mammals that does the most scent marking in their home range. And we assume that the scent marking is communicating. I'm here. Uh, other people are welcome. Other other otters are welcome to join me. You know, for the couple of days I'm going to hunt in this area, and um, and they avoid confrontation and conflict. It's very rare to hear about otters fighting one another. Uh, so it might be a way to avoid conflict. I don't know about that though. I'll talk a little bit about that in the when I get into the, how I surveyed. Uh, but anyway, the, the thing I found is that the latrines or the scent stations on Long Island are all near the headwaters of their watersheds. And um, it seems like an otter is already deep into that watershed when it comes across a scent station. If they were marking the area to communicate whether it's okay to proceed any further, you would think a lot of the scent stations would be um, downstream um, near the outlet of the watersheds. Uh, the otter reproduction is a fascinating, uh, complex thing. So I'll see if I can walk you through this. We'll start over here in the upper right. After the yearlings disperse in, um, in the wintertime, the female, um, gives birth to the next litter. Okay, so on Long Island that happens, it could happen as early as late February, but definitely by early March, um, the pups are born. The act of giving birth, um, to, uh, after, after giving birth, the female then um, goes into estrus for a short period of time, and she's receptive to mating. This is kind of, a little odd in that she really has to be careful about a male coming too close to the natal den because he might kill the pups. Um, and this is something that John Coolish uh, mistook, I think, because when he was trapping otters many years ago, the, the male and the female were kind of, kind of, you know, checking each other out. And, um, and that was in the wintertime during in the rut. But and, and so he assumed that the, the male and the female hung out together all the time, um, but, but that's not true. It's just in the winter time. After they mate, the male takes off and the female doesn't want to have anything to do with them. So 
uh, the female mates and um, the blastocyst forms. And at a certain stage, it ceases cell division and it doesn't implant in the uterine wall and it just free floats in the uterus. It's called delayed implantation. So then in, in, in the, the, the pups are completely helpless and they, um, they don't leave the den until about two and a half months of age. They get their first swim lesson by the mom. Um, they tend to float head down, butt up. So they have to be assisted into the water and sometimes dragged into the water, kicking and screaming, but they quickly catch on. And, um, and uh, by, by, by July, they're weaned, um, but they're, they're fed by the mother. The mother will catch fish and may just injure the fish and then they have to finish it off. They spend 10 to 12 months of their first year traveling with their mom in her home range. And then um, now she's, she's already mated, okay? These, these young were born from the previous year's mating. And in January, when day length gets to be about 10.5 hours in length, um, the blastocyst attaches to the uterine wall and starts a normal gestation period of about two months. The young um, leave uh, sometime between January and March when she's going to before she gives birth to the next litter. So um, why such a long period of parental care for at least with the mom? And the mom might have a subadult female helper. Well, we're not really sure about that, but um, I have noticed on Long Island that these curious pups will do bizarre things. And I think they need mom to keep them out of trouble. So the one on the left went into this have a heart trap that was set for raccoon and baited with a can of sardines. Now they don't, they don't, they don't really scavenge for food. It was adjacent to a koi pond and the owner was getting upset that a lot of the koi were getting taken and the nuisance trapper assumed it was raccoons. Um, but he, he ended up catching this young pup that was probably uh, between four and five months old. And the one on the right decided uh, when he was traveling with mom and his siblings that, um, oh, this, this little reflecting pool in someone's backyard would be cool to go play around in. And he jumped in there, couldn't get out. Uh, it was steep-sided um, concrete reflecting pool. The owner came out the next day at about 11 o'clock in the morning and like, oh my God, there's an otter in my, in my pool. And he scooped it out with a, with a fishing net. So that, that fishing net at the top is 24 inches in diameter. It's just a very young pup. And I'm sure uh, he caught up with mom and learned his lesson, but <laughs> kind of funny. Um, Let's see. Yeah. Okay. So why, why study otters? I threw this in because, um, you know, something I take for granted, but there are actually some cool things about otters. So they're top of the food chain and they're top of a specific food, food chain. They're top of the aquatic food chain. And there's a process called biomagnification. So if you have, if you have some environmental toxins in your watershed, they get, um, they get, um, magnified as you go up the food chain, um, as this diagram shows. And river otters are the end of the line. Um, unlike eagles, unlike osprey, which are also top of the food pyramid, kind, you know, well, for the osprey, very strongly aquatic uh, predators. But they're migratory. So when you're doing, you know, if you find, say, for example, DDT, you know, you might not know where the DDT is coming from nowadays. It could be from South America. Um, but the river otter is going to reflect the water quality in that specific watershed because it's there all year round. 
And the, and the, the New York State DEC <clears throat> has a program where they collect tissue samples from otters in all the watersheds that they're found in in the state. And recently they used those markers to check for how well their mitigation measures worked in the Hudson River when they had to, when they, when they decided to dredge up the old, um, forget what that was, the GE plant. Um, it might have been PCBs. Um, how well their mitigation measures worked. So they, they caught some otters before and after uh, the project and to, re to see whether those toxins got um, resuspended and, and, and got into the aquatic food chain. So, so pretty neat. <clears throat> okay, so I want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, the natural recolonization of Long Island and what happened. I mentioned the fur trade that decimated populations throughout North America. In New York State, in 1900, the population was estimated to be a very small population centered on the Adirondack Park. And in, um, for about 10 years, the state, there were no real conservation laws back then, um, but the state put a moratorium on hunting and trapping otters back in the night from 39 to 48. And it took another uh, nearly a hundred years for otters to recolonize um, the Eastern half of the state. So mostly the Hudson River watershed so then um, in 1995, we, you know, this the whole western half of the state did not have otters and they decided to do a reintroduction project. They reintroduced around 280 otters over the course of five years to various locations in western uh, New York. Um, they decided not to do anything on Long Island because of the fragmented habitat and they, they, it was questionable whether how well they would do there. So one thing that some of us are questioning um, is the is the idea of, 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 of spending all this time and energy doing a reintroduction project, trapping otters in one part of the state and moving them to another part of the state when um, you could have not had a trapping season in at least a portion of the state that's adjacent to the No River Otter living area. So this, you know, this band along here. Because if you look at the statistics that I could dig up, uh, you know, since they have digital records, um, over the 10 years, over our 10 year period of trapping season, 2009 to basically 2019, over 10,000 otters were killed um, by trappers. And um, then, you know, another thing is, so, so was, was the reintroduction really necessary if they had just um, really looked at whether or not they should have trapping adjacent to the areas that you want the otters to recolonize. So that's, a, that's a question out there for some of us. And then there's a number of my colleagues that are questioning the general idea of having a trapping season for apex predators. Um, I know Mark Elbrock, who does a lot of work with cougars out west, um, he's, he's found that there's a whole, whole social structure to the population of cougars in a given area that trapping really disrupts and um, not, not really good. Uh, one of the things that we really need to look at in the big picture is our North American model, model for wildlife management. And um, we, we did try and do this some years ago, but we, I think it's worth another crack, is the wildlife agencies get a lot of their funding from licenses to hunt and trap. And with the real interest in wildlife viewing, particularly wildlife photography these days with the new cameras, it's amazing. Um, people get really hooked on that. They're spending a lot of money. 
we could look at a tax on, on recreational, certain recreational things like that and fund wildlife projects, wildlife agencies and move away from this whole trapping uh, and, and, and hunting routine in some cases, not all cases, but um, to, for an example on Long Island, I've been trying to get the state to remove several species, several fur bearers that they have no documentation of the distribution or population size. Matter of fact, one, the gray fox, we all, on, all the naturalists and field biologists on Long Island thought it was extirpated, but a, a roadkill showed up in 1995. That's on the allowable list to trap. And um, it, it, it's totally you know, uh, unprofessional, along with the mink, the long tail weasel, and the striped skunk. You, you can't justify that with any of the current data um, that we have on those species. Okay, so getting back to um, the river otter, um, this was the last survey done of Long Island. It was based on field work done in the 1960s. And um, Paul Connor um, mentioned that uh, the river otter was extirpated based on his research in, in back, back in the 1800s. And he found no otter sign on Long Island during his surveys in the 60s. He, this was published in 1971. So Long Island is the largest island in the lower 48. Um, and it's a real challenge for some species to to colonize uh, because of um, the fact that the closest point to the mainland is one of the largest metropolitan areas in the world, New York City. And for otters, so this was a this was a phone call to John Coolish many years ago. Um, John, can a river otter swim across? Long Island Sound from Connecticut. It's it's basically the the longest distance is about twenty miles. It was a long pause, and I yeah, think he was doing the math. And he, yeah, yeah, I think they could do that. That that's like, you know, a four hour swim at maximum for them. And um, what we what we didn't know what he didn't know was. Uh, they, they, they can't detect a landmass, at least this is what we, we think, they can't detect a landmass more than about seven miles away. So at the time I started this study in 2008, the literature had the maximum uh, recorded open water crossing of seven kilometers or about four miles, which limited them to uh, the very western end of Long Island Sound, hopping over from Westchester County onto Long Island. And indeed, the um, largest otter latrines I found were right here. Yeah, in, uh, in the Oyster Bay area. This is Oyster Bay right here, the Oyster Bay area and a little bit in this Nissaquag River. And then I didn't find anything until I got all the way out here um, in, in Greenport on the North Fork. And I found some auto latrines, the North Fork, Shelter Island, and um, a few in East Hampton out here. But this, it could be the, so question was, do I have a breeding pair out here? And, where did this guy come from? And I suspected he may have come from over here on Fisher's Island. Uh, so I got a grant to, to survey Fisher's Island. And indeed I found every place I looked, it was otter sign. Um, so that was an interesting, then it started a, a, a camera study, one year long camera study and all of the latrines here of one otter in every photograph and the date and time stamp, I could not say that there was more than one otter. So it's possible that was the home range of one male otter. The theme that uh, just before I started started the study, a female got hit by a car up here, and it had just had um, given birth to three young and had three fresh placental scars. So we we probably lost four otters then. 
<clears throat> so that was kind of interesting. And then how do I survey for otters? So there's a number of ways you can, you can attempt to do this. Um, you're, you're not really, sightings is very useful um, with a caveat that a lot of people mistake muskrat for otters if they're in the water, if they see, see something swimming in the water. Um, but that can actually guide you to what watersheds to look at. So sightings actually became a really cool thing from the general public and from my colleagues. Uh, tracks, we don't get enough snow cover really to do, uh, to make that a very thorough way to find their distribution on Long Island. But tracking has been super useful to pin down where exactly they're crossing roads and getting hit by cars. Because you know they'll get hit by a car and dragged along. And if I wanna get a culvert put in, or um, right now I'm designing a ramp to get them over a dam, I, I have to be able to you know, get some permits and everything. And I, I have to be able to pin that down exactly where they are and where they're crossing. Um, so I, I found that the latrine survey was the way to go. And this was something that John Coolish taught me a lot about where to look for them and when to look for them. And um, the other thing I have a note down here for is um, how do I determine whether it's a, a, a juvenile just moving through and not a resident that's established a home range there? I have to check if I find a, a latrine and map it, I've got to go back and check it a couple months later, make sure it's being maintained. Um, so uh, that was a key part of it. I just have a couple of photos of, uh, this is a beaver that made it over to Long Island, set up a dam and a lodge. And of course the otters were all over that. It's a weird little symbiosis between otters and, and beavers. And um, no one would mistake that for a river otter. And no one would mistake the muskrat on the right for a river otter. But, uh, and no one, no one would, would mistake this. We have a lot of seals on Long Island too. Um, no one would mistake this um, seal for a river otter if they're on land. But when they're in the water, um, it gets a little trickier. And the most common sighting I get uh, that's mis a mistaken ID is the muskrat. The muskrats and, and the beaver will just swim uh, flat in the water and they will never raise their head out of the water like this otter here. This is called periscoping behavior. The otter wants to see what's going on when it's been down hunting for crabs or fish and pops up and all right, you know, anything out there that wasn't out there the last time I popped up. So that's a good, that's a good ID feature that I always ask people about, you know, uh, describe what it was doing. And if they mention that, I'm like, okay, I'll put that down in my notebook and I'll go out and check that area out. Now seals will do that as well, um, but generally seals are in deep, deeper water. And um, that hasn't been a huge issue. A uh, few times people have mistaken seals for river otters. Okay, I have this video, let's see if it'll play. So this is on a pond where that um, male was for a whole year without any, any mate. And um, this is uh, several, this is like 10 years later. So um, I'm just drifting along in my kayak and they're not aware of me. But you can see, you see the whole neck. They pop up as three otters here. And that's periscoping. So um, if someone describes that, I, that's a that's a river otter. Then they 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 figured out all right what what's this? They they checked me out. They're curious, and then they decided to to leave. And they they can go um, they can swim underwater for like a quarter of a mile. I never even saw them come up anywhere here. So an otter latrine is a, or, or or a scent station is where they leave scat urine. Uh, sometimes a jelly-like material that's the best stuff for doing uh, genetic fingerprinting. Um, 
And then they also do these rolling and scraping behaviors, which, which makes it a very easy thing to find if you're doing a survey. They're always, um, yeah, okay. And then um, the visits are very short. So when I did the camera trap study, I was really surprised that um, they, they weren't, it, well, these weren't places where they were resting in between fishing. They just, you know, came, did their thing and were back in the water less than a minute. And, and pretty much all at night. So we think the function is communication, breeding status, keep out, or here's what, here's what the easiest thing is to catch, communicating that. But we really don't know. So someday, you know, we've developed this sophisticated stuff to do in the lab with the genetics, and we can do relatedness to one another. Um, but, uh, and, and someday someone will figure out how to, how to decipher the various scents. And here's a few quick videos of their behavior at the latrine. So this is the scrape. So I'm paddling along or hiking along. The latrines are always within 15 feet of the water. And they usually have a scrape like this. It's very obvious that like, whoa, what happens here? Uh, let's see. So how do I get past? <laughs> All right, this is the next one. And uh, they also like to roll around and dry off and that impacts the vegetation. So it, these are usually like bare spots where the leaves have been disturbed and there's not a lot of like huckleberry and low bush blueberry growing around. There's very little understory vegetation. And um, this is the same pond that I that I was kayaking on and saw the three. Now notice the date, March 11th. So this is a pair. Uh, the one in the background is a little smaller than the one in the foreground. And I think she um, just had young, two, uh, two pups. Because when I came back in October, I flushed a female with two pups off the... Um, out of the uh, cattail marsh, um, just a hundred feet from here. But here's some behavior, um, interesting behavior by the male. So a little scraping, a little rolling. And then he does the latrine dance. Notice the back feet up and down, up and down. So he has little, they're like Velcro-like tabs on the hind feet that exude uh, another type of scent. And then where to look for the latrines. So uh, again, this is something that John Coolish told me, points of land, small islands, obstructions where they have to get out of the water, get around the dam, and the shortest route between two waterways and always within about 15 feet of the water. And here in this slide, you can see this area. Now, this is obviously a disturbance. Um, there's no real access to this for people. And you'll, you, you might recognize some of the stuff here. So ca Canada geese will also use this. Raccoons will use this. Uh, great blue heron likes to cross over from the pond over here, walk over and try fishing on this side. So when you set up a camera trap, you find all sorts of animals will visit these scent stations. Um, but this is where the otters will leave their sign. And you paddling along, it's very easy to find these. You can't miss it. So uh, say I, I get a report of a sighting or I get a report of a roadkill. I'll go to uh, Google Earth and I'll look at the landscape and I'll look for crossover latrine, here's a point of land, here's another potential crossover latrine. So I paddled around and, you know, um, I found latrines at, at all those sites and several others. Uh, also a topographic map is, is really um, kind of a key thing. That's how I knew this was a high knoll. Uh, the other thing is they, so I'm in a lot of intertidal areas and, they won't leave scat at a, um, at a place where at low tide, there's no water. Um, so that doesn't, it's not gonna meet the, 
within 15 feet of swimmable water, not just water. And this is what you're looking for, is this fresh scat on the left and old scat on the right. And what, what, what's great about this is, you know, you're gonna see the stuff on the left, it's gonna be around for three, four weeks, maybe even a little bit longer, depending on the season. And this is the anal jelly kind of a secretion that I talked about. Again, we don't know the exact function of this. Um, this is another mystery. And this is, this is crayfish. Um, scat. So in, in 2008, my first year doing the survey, I found uh, the key thing really is the seven watersheds. Um, and uh, I should mention that a key part of doing the survey was, was getting a lot of good press in the beginning and letting people know that I was doing this. And I got a lot of good, a surprising amount of good um, information from people that I could uh, go to my maps and look, okay, where in this area that there was a sighting that, that seems valid, uh, can, I, can I look for the latrines? And you can see the two, two disjunct areas here. Um, now these latrines in the middle of the island, um, they weren't maintained. So I took them out of the, the idea that that was part of the home range. Okay, and um, I run a lot. I've probably put 200 people through uh, otter survey workshops. A lot of fun for people who like to spend time in the field and they, they've been super helpful um, over the years. And then 10 years later, I replicated the survey and I found them in 26 watersheds. So they're definitely expanding their range on Long Island but there's a lot of really excellent habitat all along here uh, that they haven't occupied. I would say they're not even at the 50% mark. Now, since 2018, they have made it to the South Shore over in this area here. There's two watersheds I've documented them in. Um, so that's kind of cool. Oh yeah, so uh, the D, unbeknownst to me, the DEC was, when they had all my reports, they had um, initiated a survey uh, for the Southern part of the state, including Long Island over two winters, 2016 and up to 2018. And they found um, for Long Island, they only found them in five watersheds. And I think, what was that? And 26 watersheds I had. So they did a little bit different thing. They did wherever a road crossed a stream, they would get out and they would walk a uh, hundred meters along the stream on the one side and then a hundred meters on the other side, both sides of the stream, downstream and upstream. It's a very chance thing to find the latrine. Um, and uh, very, a very inefficient way to survey. So um, Jackie Freer led this survey effort and uh, we've talked about doing a paper on this and um, I'm, I'm looking forward to working with her on that. Oh yeah, um, so yeah, this, this is kind of cool. On, on the right, there's a, this, this is the uh, cattail marsh where I flushed the, the female, well, I assume it was female from the time of the year and two pups. So I go in there and you can only access this by kayak. And they created these couches in the cattail marsh so they could lay around high and dry and, um, and rest during the day. And if you, anything that's gonna come in there is gonna make such a racket that they're gonna know you're there well in advance and be able to escape. And they have all different routes to escape like a spokes of a wheel. That was really interesting to me. And in that same area in the winter, they made a little snow den. So the wind blew the snow off the pond and into a drift, I, this, the cattails caught, piled it up about four feet high and um, they burrowed in and then made a nice little place to hang out, a little micro environment that was a lot warmer than just being out in the air. Um, 
this this map shows uh so i had a road kill up here in riverhead and this is the Peconic river down here and um there's a little tributary coming up here but i'm like where are they going i know where they're coming from but where were they going or this one going and i found these little tiny ponds and there were latrines and all these little ponds. I could walk across these ponds. I mean, they were, they were, but there's stuff, you know, crayfish, tiny fish that, that they could eat in there. And I, this is gonna be a very tricky roadkill situation to mitigate. Uh, yeah, another thing, um, well, okay, going back to that, how did they even know there were ponds up there. Was it just chance roaming around? I don't think so. Um, these are disjunct, unconnected wetland areas. And it's this is really developed. They're all car dealerships and shopping malls. And they know for this, how did they find this watershed connects to Long Island Sound? So I knew they were in here. And I knew they could use this green belt and get to the South Shore, but how did they find Lake Runkonkoma over here? There's no connection. And look at the development in there, and you can see it's it's a couple miles away. Um, fascinating. And I, I it's just hard to believe they would have roamed through neighborhoods and just happened to chance on Lake Runkonkoma. Um, this is um. This is the manual I worked on. So in, in, in doing these workshops and um, training people, and, and I love getting emails from colleagues. I think I, I think I found Otter Tracks. I put together this 30 page manual and um, this is the most common track I get uh, from even, even, believe it or not, even wildlife biologists colleagues. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is the raccoon. Um, the finger-like tracks and the, the, the river otter has boldest toe pads. So as a general rule, it doesn't really connect to the, to the palm pad here, the metacarpal pad. It would be, it would be a palm pad and then, and then this pad. And also the, the river otter on the hind foot, uh, this inner toe is dropped further down. And uh, here you can see that. Um, here's the hind left foot, and that's the inner toe. It's really not in, it's, it's kind of dropped down a little more. And here you can see it on the, the right foot, uh, the right hind foot, toes dropped down. Oh, yeah. And then here's the, so here's the toe pads, and it doesn't connect with the metacarpal separating, at least for the hind foot. And um, there's another thing I like to talk about instead of looking at the individual prints, but looking at the, the, the gate pattern. The raccoon gate, this is a, this is a hind and a, whoops, sorry. Uh, this is a hind and a front, and this is a front and a hind. So right hind, left hind, so on down the line. Now, this is that classic walking gate. So if you draw a line, from the front of the toes, the front of the toes, you get a diagonal going down to the right, diagonal going down to the left, diagonal, not so much a diagonal, unless it's a straight line, but a little bit of a diagonal going down to the right, left, right, left. That's the, the walking gait. You'll never see that gait pattern in an, in an otter. The otter, you might have the two by two, but it's the same diagonal all the way through. And that, even when you get snow, and you can't see the individual toes. You can't count the toes. They, they both have five toes. You know, you're following an otter here because it's a, the, the diagonal alternates. So very useful uh, to look at the gate. And of course, and, and on, on a pond. So this, this on, on the left here, this was raccoon tracks on a pond. And um, the otter was also on the pond. And, you know, you, they're always going to do the belly slide when they're in a flat surface, if they have some snow. Um, lessons learned. Yeah, so another lesson learned is kind of an embarrassing call to uh, one of my colleagues 
works for the DEC and he does the necropsies up in Albany. And I said, Joe, how do I tell the male from the female? <laughs> okay, so these are streamlined animals. Um, they, their external genitalia doesn't really show up very well. So he got a good laugh out of that. But he said, you gotta palpate this area and with the male, you'll feel the baculum, which is a bone uh, sheathed by the penis. And um, if you probe around a little more, you'll find uh, the opening here, which is obviously further back than the, the female um, genitalia, which is close to the anus. Um, so now I know how to tell male and female. And my, my next phase of the Otter Project is uh, working on um, mitigating road kills. This is my first project is man, at a five foot tall dam. The road is above my head here over, over the box culvert. They're coming from a pond on the right to a tidal creek on the left. And this, this is a, you know, too much of an obstacle for them to jump down or to climb up. So they cross the road, they get hit by a car. And I made a simple staircase here which I knew the otters would love because this is gonna be like, not only a point to get from A to B, but something they can run up and down and have, and have fun on. So I set up a video camera and sure enough, with, within, uh, within two weeks, I got a nice video of them uh, using this. Let's see, I think this is the video. Yeah, there we go. So one went right away and they all have different personalities, just like all animals. And the other one was like, I don't know about this. I mean, it was almost all the way down, <laughs> sniffing around and maybe it's another day. And then it's buddy comes up and says, hey, nothing to it, follow me. And Unfortunately, the camera shut off before I got it definitely going down, but I'm pretty sure it went all the way down at this point. Um, yeah, she came back for a third try. Okay. And that's it. Uh, big thanks to all my um, sponsors, big and small, and uh, We'll do a Q and A. Sorry, I, I went a little bit long there. That was so cool. Thanks, Mike. If you want to stop sharing your screen, okay. um, we we do have some questions, but we are tight on time, so I might just do a few questions, and then if people have more questions, um, would you feel comfortable if they emailed you? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, what we'll do is when we send out the recording of your talk to all the participants, we'll put your email in it and you can ask your otter question if you didn't get a chance to hear your question asked this evening. But we have a question from Karen who's wondering who eats otters? Like who are their predators in Long Island or besides cars being? Right. Born? Yeah. Okay. Good question. So you, you, you in the literature, you can find uh, various uh, incidences where uh, a bobcat might have preyed on a pup or, or a wolf might have got a pup, but generally it, it says they really don't have any major predators. So their mortality is just their lifespan, um, road kills, hunting and trapping. They're an apex predator top of the food chain, yeah. Great, and here's a question from Anne. Um, she lives in Massachusetts and she needs help figuring out if what she's seeing might be otters. She says, in January, we were watching otters on a pond. Once we found ourselves standing in the area near the shore that was covered what look, with what looked like fish scales. We're wondering if we're standing on the latrine. Yeah, very possible. Um, so again, there'd be, there would be there, latrine has certain characteristics, one of them being close to the water's edge. And um, also, I didn't mention this, but they, and this is another mystery, they only do scent marking um, between 
November and um, into early May. And in the summer months, they, 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 won't, they won't visit the latrines and leave anything. They might be visiting latrines. So what is that about? If, if they're communicating to avoid confrontation, it's a, it's a little hole in that theory because they don't mark year round. Uh, the marking peaks in November when the mom is traveling with her pups and the pups are getting ready to leave. So that kind of makes sense. And, the, and it peaks in the, in the winter months, particularly um, February, March, when the, the rut is on the mating. But there's a dearth of, 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 of scenting in the, the summer months. Very interesting. It sounds like there's a lot of opportunity for more otter researchers out absolutely, there. Absolutely. So if you feel as inspired as I do tonight after Mike's talk about otters, where I learned a ton, um, and thank you so much, people are saying it was otterly amazing. So um, I just want to say um, thank you so much. And again, if you didn't get your otter question this evening, look for an email from Miles. Um, and Mike, before you go, if people wanted to get your booklet and read more about your survey, um, maybe if you can send that information to me and we'll include okay. that in our email as well. And that way people can read more about your survey and, and learn some more. So thank you so much. Um, we're giving you a big round of applause. And maybe okay. one day you can come up back to the old Harris Center and do yeah, the otter workshop. That'd I'll be, be in touch maybe this winter. Okay. Yeah. That would be really cool. The old stomping grounds. The old yeah. stomping and, grounds. Uh, and keep up the good work. Uh, I, I've actually used the Harris Center as a model down here. Oh. Uh, and, and the specific instance was how your education program, uh, you know, has, has worked so well in, 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 in that all the people on the planning board, the zoning board, the conservation board, they all went through the Harris Center Environmental Education Program, which is terrific. It's really it's true. Amazing. So keep thank up you so work. much. Yep. We will. And um, thank you again. And thanks to everybody this evening for um, coming to find out more about otters. And Mike, thumbs up to you. That was fascinating. Okay. Thank you. Be in touch with me. Bye. Keep up the good work, Mead. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, Susie. Bye, Mike. Thank you.